Um, yeah, so I'm, this is going to be the first uh, part of the epistle of Jude. And um, when Pastor asked me to speak about Jude, um, I, I thought it was a, a, a little bit of a challenge because it only has 25 verses. <laughs> but as I was studying and he sent me some of uh, his notes on that that were like 170 pages, uh, I had enough material, and the difficult part was to concentrate that into a message, in three-part message. So it's, um, it's been a, an experience. It's, I have enjoyed studying uh, the epistle. And uh, we're going to start with a little bit of who Jude was. The interesting thing is that Jude is basically the same um, name in the Spanish version is Judas. It's the same one that we use for Judas Iscariot. And this Judas um, can, can be, is used in the Bible as Judas or uh, Judah, uh, which means praised. So when I was a kid, I remember that I used to think, well, Judas wrote an epistle, so he must have been like a good person before he betray the Lord. It was not the same Judas, obviously. So that's uh, something out there that in Spanish we have to um, uh, make sure that people understand that this is not the same Judas that betrayed the Lord. Jude uh, was basically a Jesus, one of Jesus' half-brothers, just like James. Actually, it's referred in different portions of the Bible James as a uh, brother of James. So to start with, I um, thought it was very interesting because um, on Mark 6, verse 3, we can see uh, it says uh, it's, that some people were questioning the Lord. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And the same portion basically is repeated in Mark, Matthew 13.55. And uh, it specified James, uh, Joseph, Simon, and Judas is called here. So in, the, in Mark, we can see that he's called Judah. Matthew, he's called Judas. Um, and... Obviously, he's the same uh, Jude that wrote the, the epistle. But what's interesting is that the Lord Jesus was saying that he's a prophet is not without honor, or um, but in his own country and among his own kin. Uh, so we can infer from this that they, his brothers, did not believe in him back then at this point. Actually, in Matthew thirteen fifty eight, it says, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief, the belief of the whole people. Um, and John 7, 1, it says, um, I'm sorry, 7, 5, it says, neither did his brethren believe in him. So, interesting, because it's, it's, it's hard to be light or be a prophet in your own household. Um, and this is something that we have... Uh, experience like I have seen how coming from a, a family that that has been in the ministry for um, all of my life basically my dad my mom serving the Lord and how many people um, have an appreciation a special appreciation for them and to me that was just mom and dad and obviously I will love them and honor them and all that but never when when I was a kid, I saw my dad like as a like a you know like someone who spiritually like I was above me spiritually. I, that was dad. He was dad to me when I was a kid. So same thing with my brother. I have a younger brother, and um, we both are buddies. We enjoy our time together. We had fights as any brother and will have. But I will never never think of me, of myself, 
and th this is not in an arrogant way that I'm saying, but never see myself like being like, oh, David, I'm your servant, <laughs> or I, uh, not in that con condition. So when you have brothers, sisters, it's, um, it's understandable why um, back then maybe Jesus' brothers had some unbelief of what, who Jesus was because they were raised together and they were in the same household all of their lives. Um, maybe Josiah can feel identified with that, being that they are so many brothers. And yeah, this is uh, it's just something that it's looking at your brethren like someone who has, a, you know, like a, a higher position upon yourself. But now um, we can see that when Judah, um, as the time went on, and how he starts uh, in this uh, this epistle, he says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So he doesn't identify himself as Jesus' brother. He says the servant. And in Greek, it, this is the, it's in the context of uh, bonded or bond slave. Um, the Greek word is duolus, is bond slave of Jesus Christ. Um, he is called half brother of Jesus Christ, and he's call, called um, James' brother or Simon's brother. Now, we can see that um, they were also, he was serving with the other apostles, obviously. And we can see him in Acts, in the book of Acts. And um, on chapter 1 and verse uh, 13, it says at the end, Judas, the brother of James, this all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brethren. So everyone else, this is happening after Jesus has resurrected and they all now believe in the Lord. They all um knew who Jesus was. Um, con the continuation here on the second part of the verse of Jude 1.1, 1, 1, it says on the second part, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserving Jesus Christ and called. So we see three aspects here, that he's addressing this epistle to them, basically to those who are saved or believers um, in we can see that James, or Simon, his brother, uh, addressed his epistles to the Jews or to the, to the tribes back then. But uh, Judah, or Jude, he addresses this epistle to everybody who, who is a believer. And he specifies to them that are sanctified, which is the first aspect, sanctification or holiness. Uh, this is where the message of um, basically super grace fails. And uh, it's because we must be sanctified constantly. We must do this daily, basically. We're not to use the grace to live our lives, feeding our flesh or lasciviousness and thinking that nothing is going to happen, that we are already sanctified. And that, that's the, the, the wrong of the super grace or hyper grace message. Um I have spoken before in a previous message how the priests used to, before going into the presence of the Lord and presenting a sacrifice, they had to submerge themselves in, in water, um, had to be running water from a spring that had was pure, um, and they had, this is representing the word. So every time, basically, this every day we need to do that, clean ourselves, wash ourselves in his water, and um, there has to be a separation of the flesh. He, um, we, if we are believers and we have decided to take this path and walk with the Lord, we have to um, be obedient. We struggle, of course. We are not there yet, and we're not in heaven. Like Pastor Dan Karen Jr. has said before, it's different when you're like in Bible school, separated from everything is probably easier 
sometimes. Um, but when you're exposed to the word, when you have to deal with people uh, that that obviously are come from different places, come from different backgrounds, and they have different uh, beliefs. Um, is it is a a constant um, challenge for a Christian to be obedient to his word, to the truth, and um, it, it can be hard. It can be tricky, especially these times when everything is that is bad is being called good. And if you're if you say anything about it, then you're you know the bad person. <laughs> so it, it is hard, but this is a constant exercising of our faith by trials. We must love. We must be lovers of the truth. Um, John three nineteen it says, and this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doth evil hated the, the light. They hate the light. Like everyone who practices evil, they hate the light, and that's why. There's so much, so much trouble here in this society. Um, on verse 21, John 3, verse 21, But he that doth truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. The truth will also equip us to bring others into salvation. Remember that we must be, we're called to be witnesses, the, we are called to be the salt of the earth, the salt of, and pepper, like <laughs> like uh, one of Liz's uh, bosses said one time. So we were called to be the salt and pepper of the earth. <laughs> but um, this is in the context of the Beatitudes. Remember that when the Lord said that we are the salt of the earth, um, he continues on with the Beatitudes, the Sermon of the Mount, and we just uh, received some teaching of that on that so um, we must be humble and have compassion for the souls too we uh, are not supposed to be you know like uh, uh, an exclusive uh, you know like like this is only for me and and oh you're you know, we we have to to approach and try to be witness to some other people And the Lord is going to give us wisdom for that. Um, The Lord is portrayed as a good shepherd. Remember that. He is the one who is the shepherd. And we are his sheep. The sheep typically is not uh, an animal that will not... It will not have like a defense system against the the enemy. Like if a wolf, a lion or... (laughs) uh, you know, if it's attacked, a sheep has no natural d- defense. It's not even fast enough to outrun uh, the the enemy, an attacker. So this is for us to rem- remember that when we say that I am saved, we are not boasting of our own merits. What we're boasting of is that we have a shepherd, and he is the one who he's. He, we're boasting of my shepherd's merit. So he's the one who who help us uh, walk in truth and and help us to to conquer. Now, I remember that a few months ago, Pastor Dan was saying something in the lines of uh, to develop holiness, a believer must experience trials and temptations and overcome. He mentioned, I I, I believe that that's what you said, but that Adam was not holy, I believe, that he was innocent, but he had not conquered or had not been sanctified. He had not conquered trials. He had not conquered temptations, I believe. I hope I'm good with the doctrine. <laughs> okay, on the right line, yeah. So there's a, something different there. It might be the translation. <laughs> but um, but yeah, that's that makes sense. We have to develop... Um, we become good of, on what we practice, and if I like practicing soccer, I become good on practicing on playing soccer. Uh, same thing if my father-in-law he likes to make knives, he becomes good on doing making knives, and then he once he gets good on that, he just leave it behind and moves on to another <laughs> to making watches. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, but um, we become good in what we practice. So we have to develop holiness and um, in experiences, be exposed, basically. We're going to be exposed, not because we are looking to be exposed, but we are going to be exposed if we're in this world. world. Um, now, we have to remember that on John 3, 8, let me see, what's that? Yeah, we need to be born of the Spirit so that we can understand the spiritual things. Um, first Colossians, no, I'm sorry, first, um, first Colossians, yeah, first Colossians, oh, no, first Corinthians, I'm sorry, uh, first Corinthians 2.14, it says, but the natural man received not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So we want to be those who can understand and have a spiritual mind, so that we can walk with discernment. And um, Romans 8, 4, it says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So, to be born in the Spirit and to have that mind of the Spirit, um, this is not about us becoming like, oh, like all the time, like, even our moves like to be very no it's more about having the discernment having that sharpness of mind to understand the spiritual things to understand when something is truth when something is not um or how to react to, to certain circumstances in life um this is regarding the first uh, point that uh, Jude said to them that are sanctified by the God the Father. And then he continues, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. The preservation is um, the sense, Pastor Dan wrote on his notes that this is in the sense of being in a fort to be preserved. The enemy cannot come in, nor can he get to you, yet we can easily leave the fort. And um, I was um, thinking about the journey of Israel when once Israel came out of Egypt, um, the Lord preserved their lives. He didn't allow, he didn't let Pharaoh or the Egyptians to go out and take them back into Egypt because they were delivered already. Now, if a group of people remember that they were having struggles and sometimes they would think, oh, the cucumbers or oh, the melons or oh, the the fruits or the vegetables we had in Egypt. So people still had Egypt in their minds, in their hearts. At that point, they could potentially go back, and they I think they almost did a couple of times, go back to Egypt, but not because Pharaoh was coming and take them back. No, it was because of their own decision. So obviously they didn't do it, but... Um, it was not until they crossed the Jordan that there was a circumcision of heart. And that's the type of circumcision we need to ask the Lord to make in us, to perform in us. Because we have to die to those desires of the, the desires that we have. Um, and we have to cross the Jordan where nor the enemy can come out and get us, but neither we are longing for that, where the Lord take us from, delivered us from. So, in Psalm 91, it says, um, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say unto of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. So, He's giving us a promise here. Um, we shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. But, I mean, it's, it's for those that dwelled 
in the secret place with the Most High. I mean, it's not saying that the Lord is sheltering us just because we are his sheep, but it's saying from the perspective of me as the first person or second person in this case, he that dwelleth, I, if I dwelt in the secret place of the Most High, I will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. But if I decide not to dwell in that secret place, then I will be exposed. I will not have that uh, protection. So this is that condition, basically, to dwell in his secret place, to be preserved. Um, Pastor Dan had many notes about... Um, some of the, the doctrines out there, and one of those is uh, the Calvinistic doctrine. It says that they like to talk about being in God's hands and that no man can pluck us out. And this is true, but uh, there's nothing that will prevent us from um, leaving God's hand either. So we still have that free volition, basically, or free will. The enemy can't walk in and drag you out, but he can walk out. We can walk out ourselves. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, and this is talking about the, the the preservation. Talking, I'm not talking about people moving to other places. I'm talking about us as a Christian where the Lord, um, the condition where he wants us to be. Um, the, the third part that he, Jude, says here uh, is to those that are called. And um, in his foreknowledge, God has called each of us. He called Samuel um, in a marvelous way, and he can call anyone just like he called Samuel, but not necessarily. He also called Moses at the burning bush, and... Um, he called Saul while Saul was persecuting persecuting Christians. But he can also call somebody like he called the centurion in the Bible. So we are all called. And um, in his foreknowledge, God has a calling for us. And if he has brought you to this place uh, and to this moment in your life, uh, is something that we have to appreciate, we have to love and, and, and consider every day. We're his, the ones who he has called. Um, moving to Jude, the, verse, the second verse here, it says, Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. So, Jude... Um, we don't have much information about his personality, but we know that he had a heart that had become humble, that a heart that now believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he probably he cared about people, and he will be someone who had nice things to say. His name is uh, praised, um, so I don't know if that has uh, some meaning here that he was someone who will be good at praising people as well, but. Um, he sounds like, oh, where is Jude coming with this epistle? It, it, it's a good start here. He has very kind words to say. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. He starts by making this sweet introduction or declaration. Um, he starts with, with reminding the people about peace, which is something that we need. We need to constantly be reminded of peace. Philippians 4, 7, it says, um, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. So that peace of the Lord that overpasses all understanding. And um, his love, which is um, no other love than, higher than what God, God's love or the Son's love, um, God so loved the world and he gave his only begotten son. There's no comparison to that love. So we have to have that type of love and his mercy. His mercy, remember that Lamentations 3.22 and 23 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So 
we have to be remem- re- re- yeah, reminded of, as, as his uh, people, as the one who are sanctified and called, of his peace, his love, his mercy, that um, those are there for us to to be part of. Um, even some Christians that struggle with being uh, too... Uh, what is the word? The Christians that beat themselves for not being uh, holy all the time, or for struggling with with uh, thoughts or with flesh, uh, there has to be some sort of balance there, and be merciful to yourself because the Lord is being merciful to us as long as we sanctify ourselves every day and bring these things before the Lord that He doesn't like. Uh, we we gotta be merciful. Uh, this is something that some Christians, not many, but I have seen that they're not very merciful to themselves. They beat themselves too much. Um, on verse three, it says, "Beloved," this is Jude still. Uh, verse three, "Beloved," when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful needful for me to write. Unto you and exhort you that ye shall should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So the post, here's the purpose of this pistol is to keep people from losing their salvation. Basically, he has seen something in the church. He has seen maybe, uh, I mean, in many churches or many groups, well, wherever he was traveling, something was going on. Something was detected by the the apostle here. And he was warning the church. He didn't spend much time with um, sharing about his trip or with um, sharing a story about anything. He went straight to the point. He just had two verses, basically, of an introduction. It was sweet. It was something that he was showing care for the people, for the believers. But at the same time, he goes right into... Um, there's something going on I need to be to warn you about. And um, we are not exempt. This is for the church back then, for the church in this time. And he's talking about um, apostasy. We're not exempt from being exposed to that. Even ministers that are ordained, Pastor Dan was, uh, was explaining in his notes that um, some ministers have been ordained to even be uh, apostates and um, they have been with, within the foreknowledge of God they, they were going to be like that like Judas that betrayed the Lord the Lord knew from the very beginning and he had been ordained to do that so even to to cause confusion in the church or to try out what is truth in the church or within with the believers um these people are used by the Lord. And um, there was an experience that Pastor Dan was sharing about a man who the Lord told him to invite a preacher that was an evangelist in the street. And this pastor didn't know who the person was, but he, in obedience, he invited him over to speak. And this man took a lot of people out of the church with him because what he spoke there and the pastor asked the lord like why you asked me to bring this man was that you and the lord said yes i just wanted to try what was and leave here what was um truth and 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 wanted wanted to clean the house basically this the remove the tears yes so um Sometimes the Lord uses people that are opposed to do that. We're not... Um, Jude is, is um, making a call here, like someone who is alerting somebody from an imminent, life-threatening risk. Just like if someone sees a house that is burning in fire and there are people inside, you're not going to wait and try to be polite and come in, knock at the door and wait for somebody, you're going to start yelling at them like, hey, get out. 
So that's the sense of this epistle. He has seen something that was going on and was being um, raised within the church, and he wanted to make sure that people were warned about it. And it's a warning that we have these days as well, because the enemy, if if infiltrates people um, in the church, that they start off but by being very subtle, and it could be a doctrinal view, it could be a, a point of view, it could be um, anything that is not true. So there was a pastor who was saying that he was uh, traveling, he had to travel to one of the churches he was overlooking, and he will go every other Sunday. He had to travel three hours to get there. And um, there was this new couple at the church that they were always very nice to him. They uh, will come to the church. They will be with the church and look like they were a good Christian couple. But someone brought up to his attention that the Sundays when the pastor was not in, this couple used to invite people out, go out for lunch, go do things together or try to mingle with people more so when he was not there and eventually they were bringing some material for the kids and the person in charge told me well I need the pastor to okay this when the pastor reviewed this doc this doctrine it was um, something called um the kids of God. I don't remember exactly what was it, but it was a very false doctrine. It was a uh, doctrine that uh, they allow to uh, um, polygamy and even uh, to marry kids like that are underage. So he it was very subtle. It was he was saying that the couple looked perfectly like good Christians, and he never saw that coming from them, but. The church needs to be alert and be careful with with those uh, situations. I don't think that we have that problem here, but uh, th- that that bad. But uh, we always have to look out, watch out, and not only here within the church, but even our friends or uh, people we spend time with, uh, we are surrounded with. We have that's why it's important that we have um, a sharp mind. Uh, that knows um, the truth and can compare when something is is not true, when something is false. So this is um, something that brought me to another point here that is very important, and I have thought about this before too, but it's very important that we teach good doctrine to our children. It's, it's good that we have um, Sunday school but that's not enough. We have to teach our children. I don't have children myself, but I'm talking as a son that was raised in a Christian um, in a Christian household and exposed when I would go to the school. Even though it was a Christian school, there were many things going on there that were not uh, from a Christian behavior. So it's not enough just to bring your kids to... Sunday school, that's a blessing. Um, teachers have the ability and the, the, the anointing to teach, um, but it's not enough. We have to teach doctrine to our children. Um, I remember clearly, my mom would read the Bible to us at, at home. Uh, she will make us read, too, the Bible when we grew up. And um, sometimes it was like... But, yeah, then you're sharp. When you come to Sunday school, then you already know what the context is. You already know. You can. It's more um, of a growth. You're growing spiritually. So, uh, we have spoken about this before uh, in Judges 2, 6. And verse 7, Judges 2, 6, 7. 
It says, And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. So we have two generations there. And on verse 10, Judges 2, 10, it says, And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, meaning they passed away. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord. I underline this, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Why? Like, how come there was a generation that knew not the Lord? It was the third generation that didn't know what the wonders and marvelous things or what the Lord had done to deliver them from Egypt. And I asked myself, did parents forget about raising up their children and teach them the law just like the Lord had con commanded them? So I found a verse in Deuteronomy 6.20. And um, I thought it was very convicting here because uh, it makes me think for when Lisa and I become uh, parents. It's not an announcement, but... Uh, when we become parents, we, um, I want to practice this. Like, I, I really, I just need the Lord to give me the grace for that. But it says, De Deuteronomy 6, 20 says, And when thy son asked thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord or God had commanded you? Um, so he's asking there, and then the Lord says, uh, Deuteronomy 6.20, and I'm sorry, 6.20. And then he continues on verse 21, Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord shewed signs and wonders, great and sore, upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in to give us the land which we served unto our fathers. So we see the father here giving a testimony to his son, who is asking that, those questions. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for a good always that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be a righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he had commanded us. So I remember when I was a kid, and I, I'm using that because I'm, um, I don't have kids, so I have to put myself when I was a kid. So, but I'm not near to be like, I was not like a model kid. No, I had my struggles. I gave my parents a hard time too. And, um, but I remember when, when my father would, um, share his stories, his testimonies of how, uh, the Lord called him, how by, they were so, his testimonies is, is, is so, it was in the middle of war, a civil war. One of his brothers was lost during that time. He was never found. And many of his friends were killed because they, I mean, there was something between the guerrilla and the uh, army or the soldiers back then. It was uh, like a dictatorship too. So because of people not knowing who these kids were with or it, thinking that probably this is a collaborator of guerrilla or something, they will go out and take them and they will just not, never come back. So that was in the middle of, situation like that and he felt that um i mean he saw people following him so he came to the lord with great testimony every time he 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 tells us about that he is you can go back and almost picture it so those things they are embedded in my mind and those are the things that we might we want to share with our kids, those experiences that we had. And it doesn't only help for them to know about the wonders and um, the things that the Lord did for us, but also it helps us to not forget. Because if we don't share 
an experience, we tend to forget details or we tend to forget um, about it. So it is important. Um, I I'm going to I'm doing some school right now, and um, this is only this is not for for the spiritual career, obviously. But we had to go through some marketing um, teaching, and there was a teacher who she was very good. He, she was telling us about like how to captivate the attention of the people, what the specialists use and comparing some campaigns that have been, have won prizes worldwide. And uh, it, it has been very enrichment, enriching to me. But at the same time, she was showing how some companies um, have been unethical. And just like we know this company with the, the mouse and um, we know that they have a lot of uh, sexual um, promotion embedded in their movies or their advertisement. Um, so even in marketing, it, there was interesting to find out that that is on purpose to captivate the minds, not of the kids, but targeting the f- parents. And it's because our subconsciousness or consciousness, yeah, can perceive those things even though we're not aware of that. But she was showing us some pictures of, okay, this is, and I, I'm sure you, you guys have seen lots of them on social media, like with implicit messages, uh, subliminal messages. But it's shocking that they make this in purpose. I used to, to think that, oh, maybe there's a, like, um, um, maybe there's like a Satanist behind this company, which I don't know. But I just to think that that he is the one who gave the order. No, people are in this world are being trained to do things like that. If they do not have ethics or ethical views or beliefs, they are not going to hesitate to do it. And the interesting part about that is that we were looking at some of the advertisements and she said, you know, this company got sued $90 million. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. $900,000 or $90,000 for this advertisement. And they paid it and they didn't remove it. It's because it generates more to them, just easier for them or cheaper to pay a a fine and leave it there. So it's, it's, it's interesting. So our kids, yeah, they're being targeted. That's no question about that. Uh, Pastor Dan Karen Jr. spoke a message about that a few couple of mo- months ago about how they're being, our kids, our uh, children are being um, targeted by the devil. So doctrine is important. Good doctrine. Um, I am going to probably continue um, yeah probably because of time I'm going to stop here because uh, the next verse we can continue next Wednesday I'm not going to take finish it in four minutes so thank you for being good listeners and for being here supporting the church <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, it's been a blessing to study those those 170 pages of 25 verses. <laughs> <laughs>